You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Well, this morning, I'm going to ask uh, Ellie Biller to come. She's going to read our scripture. We are reading the Christmas story from a child's voice in a child's perspective. I might have had a harder time with my words here this morning. Too much eggnog and hot chocolate, I guess. Sorry about that. But this is Ellie Biller. And uh, would you read our scripture for us this morning? The birth of Jesus the Messiah, Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. The birth of Jesus, Luke 2, 1-7. At the time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judah, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time for her baby it came the time to her, for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid them in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. Awesome. Good job. I love it. I love it. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Biller Nation. (laughs) We love you guys. You know, when I think about Christmas, I think about the awe and the wonder that surrounds it. And it's so incredible uh, to think of what God did and what we get to celebrate And it's such a joy to be here this morning. Uh, We all uh, need a special touch from the Lord, don't we? And the Lord, he's preparing our hearts today to respond by the end of the service. We want to be believing for the impossible. Last week, my prayer was that the Lord would uncross our arms that we have mentally and emotionally created. And what that really means is, Lord, open us up to everything you have for us. Amen. You want everything God has for you? Well, we can believe for the impossible. Right in the middle of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, it says this, for nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. Will you say that with me? For nothing will be impossible with God with God. Say it one more time, and I'm going to ask Pastor Rocky Nichols to come as we do. For nothing will be impossible with God. And without further ado, this is Pastor Rocky. He's going to preach and can pick it up from there. God bless you, Rocky. We love you. Thank you, Pastor Ben. I apologize for missing my cue. He had to repeat that phrase about three extra times when I finally thought, oh, that's me. <clears throat> so I appreciate Ellie being able to read those verses because, well, how many of you can remember a time where perhaps you did that or you had children that do that? And it's so appropriate to bring this 
childlike awe and wonder into this sermon, this message, this season of awe and wonder. And this morning I sat out on my porch swing like I try to do every day. I don't know how long I'm going to continue that in the wintertime, but I was filled with awe and wonder again because the sky opened up, beautiful, clear sky. I watched four satellites pass over. I love to watch satellites. It's just a, a moving dot, but to know that something is up there moving, looking at us, well, that isn't so company, but anyways, pretty cool. Then, an extra bonus, beautiful, clear, bright, meteorite shot across the sky. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And, yes, it was right above the Gateway Church. I'm not kidding. Now, I don't put a lot of credence into that, but then I don't discredit it either because this whole season is known as the, the season where wise men, were guided to a little stable in Bethlehem by a star. Awe and wonder. I have a question for you. It's a rhetorical question. That means you don't answer. You just think. <laughs> the question is this. Do you believe in miracles? Because I know that some of you would jump right up and say, oh, absolutely, I believe in miracles. I believe, I've seen miracles, I, expect, I experience them, expect them. I believe all those stories in the Bible, word for word. Then to you, I ask you this, why? Why do you believe that? Why do you say that? Is it just the right thing to say in church? Is it because you were brought up to think this way? What do you base that answer then others of you might say, well, I know there are mysterious things that happen. can't explain them. I know that they do happen. But as far as miracles, especially those miracles in the Bible, not so much. By the end of this sermon, I hope that we all can come together and agree. We believe in miracles because we're going to have a time to pray for them. I have a story, a Christmas story. It's from the Amish. I love the Amish. I'm not saying anything bad about the Amish. Very impressed how they stay separate from the world. But it's an Amish family that comes to one of these three-story shopping malls. So you know it's fiction because they don't do that. <laughs> Mom and Dad show up with all 14 kids. Big family. Mom takes the seven girls and she heads right down, stopping at all the different shops, telling me that even the Amish women are programmed to know how to shop. Dad's standing there scratching his head with his seven boys, wondering, well, what do we do now? Telling me that even the Amish men are programmed to just wander around aimlessly and not ask for directions. <laughs> so he ends up at the end of the mall, by the elevator, goes up to the three stories. Doesn't know what an elevator is, he's Amish. Doors open up, he steps back like, whoa going on here? He looks in. It's just an empty compartment. A little old lady with her walker makes her way into that little room. The door is shut behind her. Whoa! What happened there? There's a number above that door. It says one. Then it changes to two. Then to three. Pauses. Then it comes back down to two. Then to one. The doors open up. And this time, a beautiful young lady comes walking out. Oh, it's a miracle! Boys! Hurry! Go get your mom. <laughs> in the Assemblies of God, we believe in the miraculous. We don't believe that miracles ended with the apostles. We know that there was a remnant of believers that continued through the centuries, carrying on the gifts of the Spirit. And then at the turn of the last century, we had the Azusa Street Revival, a time of awe and wonder. And our denomination, if you call it that, was birthed out of that event. We have 16 fundamental truths that came after our founding. That's our basic, our basic doctrine that we believe. Number three is the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it starts out by the miracle of his virgin birth. And that's what we dwell on today, his virgin birth. I'm going to read about it in Luke 2. I'm going to pick up where Ellie left off on verse 8. Now... I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Peanuts Christmas, Charlie Brown Christmas, right? And you know Linus reads this on the stage. Linus always has this security blanket with him. He's never without that. He comes out onto the stage, 
Everything prepares, the lights dim, and he begins to read. And there's something that you may not have noticed that you may want to watch that show again. And I'll tell you in a moment what happens. We begin reading. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. At this moment, Linus takes his security blanket, drops it to the ground. When that angel said, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. When the angels had gone away from them in heaven, the shepherds began saying one to another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry, and they found the way to Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them of this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. The word ponder. It's difficult to find a definition for that. But it's pretty much an unanswered wondering. It's not disbelief, but it's acceptance of the unknown. Think about that, pondering. Keep that word in your mind because we're going to cover it a few more times as we go on. How miraculous was this event, really? Well, starting with the prophecies, there are about 12 prophecies that I have written down here that predicted Jesus' event accurately. It begins in the garden when God says that I will send a, sell, a savior through the seed of the woman. He'd be born of a woman. He'd be born in Bethlehem. He would be born of a virgin, of the line of Abraham, of the line of Isaac, then of Jacob, of the tribe of Judah. He would be of King David's throne. He will be anointed and eternal. He is, will be called Emmanuel. He'll spend a season in Egypt. There will be a massacre of children in his birthplace town. There will be a messenger that prepares the way. He'll be preceded by Elijah, who we know was actually John the Baptist. He'd be declared, be declared the son of God. Nostradamus also was a great, great prophet. I remember at 9-11 when the towers fell, it was said that this was predicted by Nostradamus. And if you go and read the dribble that they claimed predicted this, it, I'm not sure how they pulled that out of there. But <laughs> scholars will say that there are 942 quatrains that he wrote, whatever a quatrain is, I assume it's a verse, and there are a handful that are so vague that they could fit certain scenarios. I had related to this. It's like comparing buckets of paint sloshed up against the wall with a finely, expertly executed Rembrandt painting. There's absolutely no comparison. His genealogies were also miraculous. We find two of them. The Bible has many genealogies, but we find two of them particular to this instance. Matthew has one that begins the entire New Testament. Luke has another one that comes just before John the Baptist comes on the scene. Matthew starts his genealogy with Abraham because the Jews, he wrote to Jews, and the Jews were particularly interested in his lineage as it was to the Jewish faith and the nation. He starts with Abraham, who God gave the promise to. Then he comes down through uh, Isaac and Jacob, who was the nation. Then through the uh, tribe of Judah, which makes him a true Jew. Then down through King David, and then from David's son, Solomon, all the way down to not Joseph, but
but Joseph's wife, Mary, which separates him from the sinful nature. He is not the son of Joseph. Very clever how God worked that out in that way. And it's amazing to read that. Now Luke, on the other hand, he does it in reverse order, but if we go from chronology, he goes from God to Adam to Seth, all the way down again to David. But he separates David now instead of the son Solomon. He goes through the son Nathan, which takes him out of the blood curse that was placed there that the enemy had tried to stop the, the, the savior of the world. And God cleverly goes right around that. And basically what we have is Matthew talks about the lineage of the father and Luke talks about the lineage of the mother. One is royal lineage, one is eternal lineage. We could go on and on about that and there's a lot to be studied. It is pretty impressive. The angel Gabriel appears. That's also miraculous. He appears to Zechariah and Elizabeth, then to Mary, and then to Joseph. You don't find that many appearances throughout the Bible all at one time. The angelic announcement is miraculous because an angel comes and speaks and then the sky is filled with the heavenly hosts. These, I would suggest, are the cherub angels, cherub type angels that surround God's throne and praise him all the time. Now, there's a similar, there's a similar event that happens back in Kings where Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the Syrian army. And Elisha's servant is worried. And Elisha says, God, can you open the eyes of the servant? And he then sees that the armies of the enemy are surrounded by God's heavenly host. Likewise, these shepherds perhaps were the only ones privileged to see the sky filled with angels because they're the only ones that report it. Truly a miracle. The fact that he appeared to shepherds is miraculous and that they understood these were the people that were the lowest people in society. They were kept outside the city. They were shunned. Today, I would suggest a similarity with the migrant workers that come up and they live in the orchards and the fields. They live in those little shanty towns, those little huts. We keep them separate. We try to say we consider them equal, but reality. We push them aside just like those shepherds. God came to those people, the lowest in society. The manger was a miracle that Jesus, the king of glory, stepped down and was born in a feed trough. I would relate that. Some of you might not take this very well. But it's like today, Jesus being born and laid in a trash dumpster in a back alley. That's how far he humbled himself for us. The birth, parthenogenesis, it means to be bird, uh, born without fertilization. Unknown in human history, before or again. Now there are some animals that, claim, that are claimed to be parthenogenic, but really what they do is they pass the fertilization down through the generations. This was truly non-human fertilized child. It was the Holy Spirit that did all of that. And then finally, in all of history, in all of our life, we acknowledge the birth of Christ every time we sign a check or we sign a legal document that has the date on it. Because all of our dates start approximately where Jesus was born. Now today, modern society has tried to erase the term before Christ or the year of our Lord A.D. And they've now termed it before the common era, or the common era. But if you do a little research and find out where that comes from, they cannot get away from the fact that the common era begins when this Jesus Christ person showed up. No matter how they try, the virgin birth of Jesus still remains with us. What was God's purpose in all this in the virgin birth? Well, his first purpose could be to be true to his word, to fulfill prophecy. Many were fulfilled. The one that's very common that we're probably familiar with is Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. 
And in the text of Matthew, Matthew actually points out that is the prophecy was fulfilled in Mary. I have an American Standard Bible. Whenever there's a prophecy in the New Testament, it's written in all caps. I think that's how it is. And in, in Matthew, Matthew goes and he points out this is a fulfillment of prophecy. He doesn't make us do the research. He gives it right to us. Another purpose is to resolve iniquity and provide the perfect sacrifice for sin. In Genesis 22, Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac. God has called him to sacrifice his only son in the mountains of Moriah. He stands at the base of that mountain and his son says, Dad, where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? And Abraham says to his son, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. It's a little bit different wording there. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. Then centuries later, in the fullness of time when Jesus comes into this world, Jesus, God, provides himself as the perfect sacrificial lamb and dies on those same mountains where Abraham and Isaac ascended. Then to divine, another divine purpose is to show his sovereign power. In Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to, to redeem us who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. When the fullness of time had come, you see, God in eternity past saw all this that was going to happen. None of this was a surprise. The enemy probably thought many times, ha, ha, I got this, I got him now. And God just stood back and said, hm, knock yourself out. But when the fullness of time came, when all these scenarios worked together to this one moment, Jesus left his throne in heaven and came and lived among us, revealing that God had this plan throughout all eternity. And then one final purpose, that is my own thoughts, it is to taunt and humiliate the devil. In Ezekiel 28, we see a monologue where God is speaking to Satan. And it seems to speak to Satan in the past, and then it transitions into a future where he is talking to him. Because, see, God is not bound by time. And he says to Satan, I created you higher and more beautiful than anything in all creation. But you became proud and needed more. And I cast you down out of heaven. And then he transitions and said, and one day, I will cast you into the lake of fire and you will be nothing forever. Decades ago, before I was married, I went on a trip with a best friend to Mexico. And on a Saturday night, we decided to go to the bullfights. Not recommended. One of the most gory things that I have ever seen as these novices got out there with their pokers and tried to jab and, and stop the bull, and finally someone else would have to come out and terminate the bull's life. Pathetic. I hated it. But I endured the whole thing. Even up to the end, when the master matador showed up. Way different story. This guy comes out dressed like he's walking into church with these polished boots that don't even take on the dust of the ground he has a sword and he has a red cape. And the bull is off being released out of, the, out of the pen and running around. And this matador doesn't even pay him any attention as he is addressing the crowd and joking and having fun. He's not worried because he knows the bull. He knows what touches the bull off, what infuriates him. He knows how to avoid the bull. He's not concerned. So he takes the sword and he threads it onto this big red cape. And he dangles it out there because motion is what gets the bull moving. And I assume the redness is probably helps him to easily see it. And now he begins to joke and taunt with the bull. And as the bull charges, he holds that cape out and he pulls it out of the way and watches the bull run by. 
And the bull, somewhat humiliated, looks around and now is a little bit more infuriated. And he does it again. He comes the other way. And he charges around and around and around. Finally, this bull is so infuriated, he can hardly contain himself. He's doing the scratching thing like this, and it's like, wow, this guy better watch out, because this bull means business. And it makes this charge, and at the final moment, that master matador turns the blade toward the bull as it impales itself onto the blade, skewering its heart and lungs, and falls stone cold dead at the feet of the matador. That matador is God, and that bull is the devil. And for all of time, God has been taunting Satan, pulling the cape out of his way and watching him run by. But one day, he's going to turn the blade and Satan is going to impale himself on it and be nothing for eternity. In all of Satan's schemes, Satan could not deter Jesus. Herod could not kill him. The Pharisees could not stand him. Pilate could not find fault in him. Death could not stop him. The grave could not hold him. All of the universe cannot contain him. And Satanly, Satan certainly has been shown that God is in control. And we should have no question about that ourselves. So I ask you this rhetorical question again. Do you believe in miracles? Maybe you believe fully. Maybe you believe partially just a little tiny bit or you might still be saying, not really. So if I take you back to the story about Noah's Ark, what would you think about that? Well, you might say, I'm sure something happened. There was a flood. God had to do this, but it's mostly an allegory, you know. Come on, think about it. The giraffe with his neck sticking out the porthole, the big bumbling elephant on the top, tipping the ship over. <laughs> really? What about Jonah getting swallowed by a whale then? And let me make it even worse. Because anybody can believe in a whale swallowing a person. It was actually a big fish. But there are three species of fish that I know of that can, are big enough to swallow a person. They can even stay alive for a while. But that's not even the miracle. The miracle is that God summoned that fish and spit them out on dry ground. Well, Jesus believed both of these stories. Just saying. You might have trouble believing some of these others. The burning bush that never extinguished. The parting of the Red Sea. Water coming out of a rock. A donkey talking. Joshua and the sun standing still. Can you imagine God stopping the circulation of the earth? Bonk, we'd all fly off. How did he pull that one off? The walls of Jericho far, falling. Three men in a fiery furnace and a fourth one shows up and nothing happens but the ropes get burned off. A hand writing on the wall. Jesus walking on water. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus raising from the dead. Well, let me ask you this then. Let's go back to basics. Let me ask you the, if, about the greatest miracle of all. It is said that the greatest miracle of all is creation. Because without that miracle, nothing would exist. Do you believe that God created all things? Forget about the billions of years or the seven days or how he did it and when, what the order was. Do you believe that God created everything because most people do but not everybody believes the way he wrote it we all have our own scenarios of how it happened but if you can believe that God created everything just by speaking it out then it's not hard to believe that he did it in the way he wrote So do you believe in the Christmas story? Most of us do. But do you believe in the Christmas story as it is written? 
with all the miracles and all the things that might be hard to explain, because it's really important that you do. Because if you don't, you may be compromising your faith. Do you read some stories and believe them to a point, but the extremes over here, that, oh, that's pretty embellished. I, I don't think that happened. You narrow it down to this littler window of what I can really accept. A few weeks ago, Pam and I went to Florida. And over the summer, the bushes get all overgrown. And Pam gave me the task of trimming the bushes down. I'm so thankful because I didn't know what I was going to do for a week in Florida. <laughs> so I went and got a clippers. And I walked around all these things, and I clipped off all these long sprigs all over them, about the, you know, half the length of this stage here. And then I looked back and thought, oh, okay, it's a big pile of stuff. And now there's a, about half that length of sprigs. So I go back, and I trim all the other ones off like that and get them all done and throw them into another pile. Look back, and now there's even some shorter sprigs that are sticking out. So I start to cut the sprigs off, and I wonder now, at what point do I stop trimming away and I don't have a bush left? Because there's a problem that arises when we pick and choose our own predetermined views of things. The Bible being the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, as is said in 2 Timothy 3.16, is written by men who were moved along by the Holy Spirit as it says in 2 Peter 1, 21, the Holy Spirit is God. And God does not lie, as it says in many places in our Bible. And this is where, as a preacher, I have to tell you the hard thing. And you may not like to hear this. But when you do not accept God's word as he wrote it, we start to make him out as untruthful, deceptive, even a liar. And we say that, I don't believe your word, Lord. I can't trust you. And when we cannot trust him, our faith is dead. Philippians 2, 6 says this, Who being a very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus stepped down from glory and he humbled himself. He made himself a frail and vulnerable human being. But did he have all the answers? Another rhetorical question here, because the big question is this. If Jesus is God and God is all-knowing, did Jesus know all things? And I'm going to suggest no. But read here in Luke 2. Verse 52. At the end of Luke, Jesus is now 12 years old. He's at the temple. And his parents actually left him thinking he was with the caravan. And they went, oops, we missed him. And went back and looked for a couple of days before they found him. And there he was at the temple teaching. And it says, verse 52. And then Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. If at this point in Jesus' humanity he knew everything then he would not need to grow in wisdom. In Matthew 26, 39, he is in the garden of Gethsemane. He's in that garden. He's going to be crucified the next day. And he says this, If it's possible, Father, take this cup from me. If he knew all things at that point, he would know that that wouldn't be possible. In Matthew 24 and in Mark 16, where the apostles ask him, or the disciples at the time, ask him, when is he coming back? And he said, it's not for you to know. Not even the Son knows, only the Father. He didn't know the time of his return. Does he know now? Yes. But for a time, never ceasing to be God, but he allowed his human nature to take priority. He voluntarily put himself in the position to have to learn things. From the earthly human perspective, Jesus had to gain knowledge. 
For an unknown portion of his life, Jesus had to trust and have faith in his heavenly Father, just as you and I have to do. Worship team, if you could come, please. Part of believing is having faith. And if you are not familiar with or have not read Hebrews 11, please do. It's called the Hall of Faith. It lists numerous people who were given part of understanding, but they trusted, even though they died horrible deaths, but they trusted to the end. I recently heard a television preacher say this comment. Be comfortable not knowing. Be comfortable not knowing. I have long ago arrived at that comfort. I don't know all things. There's a lot of things that I would love to know. It would explain the impossible to me. But then, where's the faith if you know all things? In 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, Paul Toward the end of that says this for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when perfect the perfect comes the partial shall pass away for now we see in a mirror dimly because then they didn't have glass mirrors they were polished brass they weren't so clear for now we see it in a mirror dimly but then face to face now I know in part then I will know fully you see, the Apostle Paul did not know it all. He had mysteries and questions that were still remain unanswered. John the Baptist was unclear about Jesus in his final days. The prophets of old probably knew very little of what they were prophesying. Daniel in Babylon envisioned the end time scenario but did not understand it. The New Testament believers in generations to follow lived through perilous times and still trusted. And even Mary, who saw and experienced much of this witnessed the awe and wonder still pondered some of those things is it okay to desire answers absolutely I still desire answers is it okay to require answers This book is a guidebook of instructions of how to get from here to there. It shows us the way, but it does not take us on all those optional excursions that we would like to experience. It gives us all that we need to know. Do you trust God. Do you accept his word fully as truth? Do you believe in miracles? Before I ask you to bow your heads, we're going to pray for a moment here. And I want to pray first of all those who are still on the fence. But there are three categories of miracles that I've laid out here. The greatest miracle of all was creation because without that we wouldn't be here. This most important miracle of all has two fulfillments. It's the virgin birth of Jesus because without that our hope is lost. But that miracle always also occurs in your heart. The most important miracle of all is the salvation of of a person's soul. And then the most commonly requested miracle are those that we pers personally ask for, those spectacular events that we long for. So let me ask if you bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. If you're in this room and you have never claimed that Jesus Christ is your Lord, if you have never come to the point of realizing that you have fallen short just like we all have and we're sinners and you 
have not come to that point of turning your heart toward him. Let me ask you, in this very moment, you could change the direction of your life for all eternity by just inviting him to make you a new creation. If you've never come to that decision and you want to do that today, I won't embarrass you by making you come up here or anything like that at the moment. But I would like to know if you would raise your hand now and wish to be prayed for for that to happen. It would be the first great step in that new direction. Then there are those that I'd like to ask if you are still on the fence, you're still needing to know some of these things and it's holding you back. Or if you once knew salvation and for whatever reason you've grown cold and you want to set another line in the sand today if you would raise your hand and just let me know so I know that there are some to pray for then let's pray this simple prayer with me for those who may still be wanting to make that decision or want to keep it personal pray what we call the sinner's prayer. Just repeat it after me if you would, please. Dear Jesus, thank you for filling this place with your spirit. Thank you for speaking to my heart today. Thank you for being the Savior of my sin. I acknowledge today that I am a sinner. I have fallen short of your glory. And I cannot save myself. Lord, I ask you today to come into my heart as I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. And change my life forever. In your name. If you prayed that for the first time or you're coming back to the Lord, please tell somebody it's very important that you do that. And now I want to have a time that we've talked about praying for miracles. But I need to point out that in Luke 18, there's a parable of the persistent widow, this woman that kept coming back to the magistrate and bothering him until he finally relented and gave in, kind of tells us to never give up on prayer. And at the end of that, Jesus says, I wonder when I come back to earth, will I find faith? It doesn't so much mean, will I find people who have been saved by faith, but will I find people who still believe enough to pray and expect miracles? And it also said that he could do few miracles in that town because of their unbelief. I want to create a spot in here, in this room, a place of belief in so I'm going to ask all of you to come forward at some level. But I'm going to ask first those of you who I know that you are intercessors. I want to ask you people to be the first wave of people to come forward and surround this area with intercessory prayer and to believe that this is a place of miracles. Then I want to invite those who I don't know are intercessors, but I trust that you know that. Follow them up and surround this place. Then for those of you who have been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, following Pastor Ben's message over the past months, who still haven't received that, who are still seeking that, perhaps you've been seeking that for years, I want you to follow them as well. And behind all of those, I'm going to ask all of those of you who need a miracle today, a miracle of healing, a miracle of finance, a miracle to save a lost friend or relative, a miracle of broken relationships or emotions, addiction, bondage, oppression, or, or those of you who 
are there to pray for someone else's miracle. And I'm going to say this. Let me read my disclaimer first. The following statement is not necessarily the opinion of the Gateway Church. Pastor Ben, his associates, so you can't hold them to answer to this, but I'm going to tell you this. If you don't have a miracle need today, then God may be finished with you. And let that sink in. Because your purpose in life is to fulfill His divine purpose in some way. And if you no longer have a divine purpose for Him, just saying, we all have a divine purpose. And we all have a list of miracles that we need done today for ourselves, for our family, for others. Let's believe that this is the day that God answers our prayers in our life and the lives of people around us. Would you please come? distancing, however you want to work that out, that's fine. But in some way, come forward, humble yourself before God, and we're going to pray for miracles right now. If you would follow with me in this. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for speaking to our hearts today, and we are expected that you will change our lives. We thank you, God, for filling this place with your Spirit, for filling each one of us with your Spirit in abundance that that spreads out to others in our lives and those around us. And Lord, I begin today, this moment, by praying for others. Because as I seen on the news this morning, the mayor of one of the towns where those tornadoes hit, he said they're no longer looking for survivors, they're looking for bodies. He said it would be a miracle if they found life in that rubble. So, Lord, as I prayed earlier today, we pray again that a miracle will occur and they find life in the rubble. We pray for all those who are hurting there, that you will restore what's lost. We pray for those who are on ventilators and on oxygen and are in the ICUs. We have people from this church. I have people that I know. There are people that I know who have been lost to that virus. God, we pray for the miraculous to sweep across this nation and this world and to thwart the plan of the enemy. For healing, Lord, there are some here with vision, impaired vision, headaches, things that just are chronic pain that never seems to end. Lord, may this be the day that they receive a miracle in their bodies. For those with bone deficiencies, those with foot ailments, those with neck pain, joint pain. I pray as Paul would pray and put the so that in there. God, I pray that you heal today so that these people can turn their attention to the purpose that you have for them and that your sovereign power would be seen. There are people struggling with finances. Lord, lift the burden so that they can turn that funding into your kingdom. There are those struggling with relationships, trust, infidelity. Lord, I pray for the miracle that they will put you first and foremost in their life and their relationship, and that alone will turn it around. Lord, I pray those for, with emotional and spiritual bondage, those who are addicted to drugs, alcohol, tobacco, pornography. Break that yoke. Break that chain. We call on you, 
Jesus, the one who gave us authority over demons and dark, dark powers, God, I pray that your son's death on the cross and the blood that he shed will cover all of these iniquities, will break the chains of bondage and addiction today, never to turn back to that. And finally, Lord, for those in our lives, the loved ones that are still lost, we pray for the salvation of each soul, that none should perish, and all would come to the knowledge of the truth, that it may be a blessing to you. May it be so. In the name of Jesus, amen. breakthrough over our lives and the places that we're seeking prayer for the places where we are looking for hope let's declare breakthroughs in our marriages let's declare breakthrough in our finances let's declare breakthrough in our families in our lives in our health situations, that you will speak life. Lord, in the areas where we feel dead, where we feel broken, where we feel hollow, that we know that we serve a miracle working God. And when we look back at all these miracles, all the way from Genesis and creation, all the way, Jesus, through your coming and your incarnation, we see a God who fulfills his promises. We see a God who is faithful. We see a God who we can put our hope in. And because you have been so faithful in the past, we give you everything now. God, we know when you answer our prayers, when you meet our needs, that we will be a living, walking miracle ourselves. Lord, let us be people that leave this place being that walking miracle. Let us be people who are fulfillments for other people's miracles, that other people are looking for answered prayer, God. And it might come in the form of a new refrigerator, God. It might come in the form of a new friend, God. But I pray that you would help us now to be your salt and light in the darkness. God, and we know that as we leave this place that you will be before us, you will be behind us, and you will be all around us every single step of the way. We give you the praise and glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone says, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You can go in the grace of God today. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.com church.